I'll talk about Gaussian identicality in linguistic ground matrix theory. Um, it's a paper uh, together with Sanjay Ranglom and Louis Sort from String Theory in Queen Mary, and but it's based on immediate previous work with Dimitri Kachaklis, who is in Apple now. So um, we heard a lot about disco cut. Uh, and I thought maybe I'll waste some of my time explaining it. Um, so I'll put on the, uh, what people think of a natural processing, natural language processing pipeline. So this is from a standard textbook in the course. So you have some input, your natural language, it can be the rules of the grammar, it can be a corpus of data, you pass it through parser, everything is automatic here, an automatic parser, it gives you a grammatical structure, this tree. Can you see my cursor moving? Can anybody see my cursor moving? Yes, we can see. Mm -hmm. okay. Then this goes through a semantic analyzer and you get semantic representations. In what we can consider as olden times, the formal uh, grammar, formal syntax times, the input was usually, uh, let's say, pen tree bank annotated with uh, uh, phrase structures, constituency based structures. It goes through something like a phrase structure parser, constituency based trees like this come out of it. They go through something like uh, a Montague-based uh, semantic system, and you get a lambda term as a result out as the meaning of your sentence. So in what we've been working on uh, since about 10 years ago, the disco cat and LP pipeline, sorry, I'll just close this door. We say, uh, okay, give us the input uh, corpus of data, we are going to use a lambic based calculus proof system, a logic, non-commutative, intuitionistic, multiplicative linear logic like it was brought up yesterday. Uh, we get a proof tree, which we will then analyze if you want using uh, string diagrams and category theory, if not tensors and tensor contraction. And at the end, you'll get vectors and tensors as representations of words, phrases, and sentences of your language. Quickly say a couple of words, why is that good? Why would you like vector representations? Uh, I'll skip this. So as it was mentioned yesterday, um, the stronghold of vector representation models are uh, predicting semantic relatedness or similarity. There are lots of data sets out there, Simlex 999, pairs of words like cop, drink, and cop and coffee that are related to each other. And if you build vectors for them, the cosine uh, of the distance between them strongly correlate with how people think uh, uh, semantically related they are to each other. So this has been a success in many tasks like parsing, like summarization, translation, et cetera. There are also uh, inference-based tasks where uh, you have pairs of words, phrases, and ten uh, sentences that entail each other, like dancing and moving, or don't entail each other, like dancing and eating. And then non-symmetric measures, like KL divergence, are used to sort of predict if they do so using the vector models. Again, vector models have been very successful. So in the disco cut, we, we've extended these type of tasks to the sentence level, so uh, here's a disambiguation task. Um, a man drew a ceremonial sword might mean that a man pulled the uh, ceremonial sword or that a man sketched the ceremonial sword. And if you build vectors for these sentences and calculate the cosine of the angle between them, you can guess which meaning uh, the ambiguous verb draw has. So we've been experimenting with these models and the, we can always find the tensor model like you see here, bold face that outperforms all the other models and comes very close to inter-annotated user agreement. Uh, and recently, we've extended these models from sentence level to discourse level when you have like a um, Manju ceremonial sort, Samurai 2, so you add a VP elliptical phrase to your sentence. And then obviously, then it becomes closer to man pulled ceremonial sort, right? You can verify this using vectors. 
And if it was Mandru ceremonial sword artist too, then obviously then it would mean man sketch ceremonial sword. So we've developed the data set with Heiss Reinholds. Uh, and as you can see in this table in bold face here, again, one of the tensor based models uh, provides best results. And this was published in NACA last year. So uh, just as propaganda for us, uh, you, want, you might want to say for what grammatical settings this homomorphic passage to tensor and vector algebras work, I would say it's invariant under any grammar. I would like to see how does it work for fractal grammars of yesterday, but we've done it for pre-group grammars, uh, easily extendable to Lambert calculus, Michael Mordcott and Heist Weinholz, they've extended it to multimodal Lambert calculus, it's been done for CCG, ACG was mentioned yesterday with Reinhard Moscons, we, we extended it to ACG. Dynamic syntax was mentioned yesterday, we've also extended it to dynamic syntax. And the last edition is this Lambert calculus with relevant modality, which is what Lachlan presented yesterday. So I think we should stop here extending these vector algebras to different grammars because it's a very routine job. This, it was problematic a bit here because the coalgebra modality has many different interpretations, which some of which might not be tractable. Interesting question. But back to the content of this talk, um, these tensors, so, so th these work, this work is heavily relying on how you build the tensors. And there are many ways of building the tensors, machine learning being very popular these days. I talk about linear regression. Uh, you want to build an adjective uh, matrix for an adjective such as red. How you proceed is that you build uh, vectors for adjective noun phrases containing red, red car, red cat, red carpet. And then you learn the matrix red using linear regression such that the multiplication of the matrix of red with the vector of the car, vector of the cat, vector of the carpet is a good approximation of the vectors of the phrases involving them. So you get a nice matrix out here. Now, now we ask, uh, what are the behavioral properties and statistical properties of these tensors? Where are they on the plane? What do they do? We have these tensors, they lie somewhere, they do something. What can we say about them? We want to study them statistically. And that's where this work comes in. Um, the origins go back to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if you have a matrix which has a set of eigenvectors, um, you are you're sort of, you sit comfortably because you know that if you keep applying the matrix to its eigenvectors uh, in the limit, it will converge to a direction like I'm trying to show here. So you know a lot about the sequence of applications of this matrix, uh, which is very nice. If it doesn't have these eigenvectors, it's a mess, like you can see here. You don't know where the subsequent applications of this matrix are going to go. You don't know where is it in the space. Now in this COCAD, we've got sets or ensembles of matrices, lots of adjectives, lots of verbs, lots of adverbs, they each have matrices. What can we say here? There is an area called random matrix theory coming from physics, which talk about distributions of eigenvalues of ensembles of matrices. And traditionally, uh, matrices that came from physics, they were mostly Gaussian. So random matrix theory is mostly studied for ensembles that have Gaussian matrices. To my surprise, it has uh, applications in computer science with the work of von Neumann, who used random matrix theory to talk about computational errors in matrix operations. And in general, it has been applied to many different types of dynamical systems, like financial systems, complex systems, and in neuroscience, where you have dynamic networks of synoptic connections between the neurons. And you study the be behavior of the mind using the distributions of eigenvalues here. Now, uh, random matrix theory, again, from its origins, relies on certain symmetries to be true about them, and the major symmetry that has been true is continuous symmetry. Um, it's been true for physics and in most applications we know this is also the symmetry that holds. But uh, for linguistic purposes, which we should ask, 
do we really have uh, continuous symmetry here? First of all, the matrices aren't uh, symmetric and they're not Hermitian, and there's no reason that they should be invariant on, on the rotation. Uh, but if you generalize um, continuous symmetry to something which Sanjay discovered and called it permutation symmetry, then it becomes very natural in the linguistic setting. So in the linguistic setting, if you change the order of the context words, the vector that you're building for your word, phrase, sentence will not change. So this is ignorant to if the context word is to the left or to the right of your word. You look at the window. So the natural symmetry is permutation symmetry. That's the novelty of our work. And that's why we've called it linguistic metrics, random matrix theory. It's random matrix theory based on permutation symmetry. So how do the Gaussian such models look like? So if you have a continuous random variable, the area under the probability distribution function, as you all know, can be represented by the following integral. Yeah, dx e to the power of minus x2. For random matrix theory, it's dm e to the power of minus trace of m2 for continuous symmetry. If you generalize to permutation symmetry, you must change minus trace of m2 to a set of linear functions, which we denote by Lm, and a set of quadratic functions, which we denote by Qm. And this is the model that Sanjaya has solved, and it looks like this. For people who like symbols, I actually love this. It has five parameters here. Uh, delta, square of the diagonals of the matrices, obviously A and B, the off diagonal of the matrices, and terms J0 and JS, which are linear in both. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the Gaussian. Um, there are two linear polynomials and 11 quadratic polynomials. In our previous paper in 2019, published in Annals of Institute on Ripo and Carré, we solved the model for two linear polynomials and three quadratic polynomials. In, our in, the, in the most recent paper, again, accepted for publication in Annals of Henri Poincaré, Sanjay solved it for all of the quadratic polynomials, all 11 of them. And uh, once you've solved the model, you have observables, right? You have these moments and higher order moments, which help you uh, say something about the behaviors of these ensembles of matrices. They are not strange things at all. So the first one here is just the trace of the matrix. Uh, so the average of the traces of the ensembles of matrices, right? The second one is the average of the trace, the, uh, the average of the off diagonal traces of the ensembles of the matrices. In second order moments, you sort of um, turn this to the power two. You take the trace to the power two for the diagonal case, for the off diagonal cases, and you can go higher and higher. Here I've got a power four example, and so on and so forth. So you get many, many different moments, observables, expectation values of the model you can work with. And we worked with these as follows. We put them against the experimental data to see how exactly the theory predicts uh, the data. So what is our data? Uh, 273 adjectives and 171 verbs built using linear regression. So these were the adjectives and verbs that had at least 1,000 fillers in the UK Wacky. And we worked with 18 spaces of 300 to 2,000 dimensions with steps of 100. So 300 dimension, 400 dimension, 500 dimension, and so on. And if you look at the five parameter model, just look at the differences between the theory and experiment. The, high, uh, the highest one is 0 0.57, still above chance, but it's quite low. It says that the theory and the experiment don't match each other very well. So you want this to be one. But when we went to the 13 parameter model, surprisingly, have a look here. The, the higher order moments, they have an average uh, accordance of between 0 0.95 and 0 0.99. So the theory and experiment match really well here. This is for 2000 dimensional space for adjectives. Same story for verbs here. Higher order moments match really well. 
And indeed, if you pl plot them, if you plot the uh, theory experiment ratios, you'll see that like in eigenvalue theory, like in random matrix theory, at a limit, so here for us is 2,000 dimensional spaces, the ratios will converge and they'll become really, really small. Just, uh, okay. So uh, having come to this conclusion, we studied the standard deviations of uh, theory experiment for the 13 moments that we had. So this is a plot for a quadratic moment. You'll see that you, there's quite a high deviation uh, for a cubic one, there's less deviation. So what can we say in general about the deviations? Uh, we, we've plotted them for um, higher order moments. And as you can see, they correlate really well with each other. So th that these are very nice. For lower or, or, uh, order moments, they do not really correlate with each other. But if you put a lower order moment with a higher order moment, you get chaos. Nothing correlates with nothing. So it seems that the, um, the message that I get from this is that if you want to work with this theory, you better work with the higher order moments with, which have a very nicely correlated um, deviation. And now, um, what are we busy with? Based on these deviations, we produced rank lists uh, for each moment. So I'll, I'll show you some of the higher order ones. Just look at them. Reasonable, numerous, usual, improved, fast, amazing. Dynamic, visual, narrow, foreign, moral, complex, female, Jewish, library for the other one. What is the correlation between these adjectives? We have been eyeing them and that's why I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> because it's very hard to find any relationship between them. So um, my last slide, future work is to find, as you can see, they each come, each of these words, they come with their deviation. So we are trying to find a way of uh, simulating the, these deviations with uh, the distances in the word similarity tasks, uh, Simlex 999, for example. The other thing that comes very nicely out of this theory is that uh, for every corpus, you get a Gaussian, the signature of a Gaussian. And then you can use these signatures to compare this corpora to each other. For different languages, do we get the same? Um, theory experiment ratios, do they have the same parameters? If you look at different corpora like sports versus political news, drama versus documentary novels, um, what kind of different signatures do they have? And then the question that came from a referee is what about we learn matrices using methods other than linear regression? Uh, Stephen Clark and Jean Maillard show that you can extend the skip gram model to learn adjective matrices using continuous bag of words. Um, these give you 300 by 300 dimensional matrices only. So w would the same results hold for these lower dimensional matrices? If you do SVD on the 2000 by 2000 matrices, do we still get the same results? And we've just got an, um, I always forget what I is. Impact acceleration account, EPSRC STFC grant to deal with this. Uh, last year when we presented this paper in uh, the previous version of the, this paper in some space, people ask, how do you know these matrices are Gaussian? You're assuming that they're Gaussian and they might not be, but we've been plotting some of these properties and they look quite Gaussian to me. And thank you for listening.